the ghost of Black Dahlia. A few years ago, I left grad school in New Mexico and returned to Oklahoma. I stayed with my mom for a while. Then mom said she was tired of the three-bedroom house she'd rented for about ten years, so I roused myself from my funk and found a furnished apartment in a somewhat seedy part of town. It was cheap, and I had next to nothing. Having moved back to Tulsa with all my possessions crammed into my car, so I moved in. I was at the time part of a Wiccan coven, and two of my fellow coveners lived downstairs, so that was part of the reason I chose that building, besides it being cheap and the landlord being pretty decent. I didn't really feel too unsafe there at first, despite the fact that the apartments across the street were home to a nest of drug dealers. But as they kept a low profile, I figured as long as I left them alone. Anyway, a month or so after I moved in, an old friend from college called, needing a place to stay since he'd just gotten a job in town. Well, in a couple of months, he and I were an item. During this time, I became aware of a vague feeling of discomfort when I was alone in the apartment. I had a rather large ficus tree in the living room, and every so often when I would pass by it on the way to the bedroom, I saw movement, sometimes glimpses of a hand and a face out of the corner of my eye. Chris, my boyfriend, said that the place made him uncomfortable also. So it was just as well that we weren't spending a moment apart anyway, since being alone at night there was kind of unnerving. Chris was at the time very interested in the Black Dahlia murder case. She was a drifter named Elizabeth Short, whose mutilated and sodden half-body was found in a vacant lot in 1947 in L.A. To this day, no one knows for sure who killed her. One night, we were lying in bed with a few candles burning in the room, talking about this and that, with the stereo on and the door to the bedroom open. Suddenly, we were both quiet. Both of us felt someone or something enter the room and stand just inside the doorway. I sat up in bed and was overcome by a feeling of awful grief. I began to cry. As we looked, there was a shadowy form against the off-white wall of the bedroom. I could see something like a hand moving. Chris suddenly grabbed my arm. Both of us noticed, with a shock of horror, that some of the clothing lying on the floor was positioned in the shape of a body, with a line between the different colored clothes, just where it would be if that body had been sawed in half, closely resembling the pictures we'd seen of Elizabeth Short's body as it was found in 1947. We were, pardon my French, scared shitless, and immediately threw ourselves into bed with the covers over our heads, after first destroying the image by shoving the clothes into a random pile. Later, we discovered a penny, dated 1962, in the entry to the bedroom. At the time, Chris was reading a book entitled Daddy Was the Black Dahlia Killer, written by a woman who claims that her father killed Short. According to the book, this man died in a car accident in Claremore, Oklahoma, about 30 miles from Tulsa in 1962. Chris had cleaned the apartment that day and picked up all the loose pennies lying around on the carpet. He swore to me that there was no penny there before. I don't know if the presence we felt there was the ghost of the Black Dahlia, but I will never forget that night. We began to wonder if there wasn't some other entity attached to the place, one that we might have believed was Elizabeth Short. We went to the library and searched for information about the building. All we found was that the apartment had been built sometime in the 70s, lots of things could have happened at that time. There were other times when we would be talking or sleeping, and would awaken or stop talking to notice that we were definitely not alone. Not to toot my own horn, but I am sort of sensitive to those kinds of things, and Chris is too. There were several occasions when we knew that someone or something was in the room with us. Sometimes it felt harmless and vaguely interested in us, sometimes it definitely sent chills up the spine. I have had some training in utilizing my own psychic abilities, for what it's worth, as part of my coven training and through my own studies. 
The most important thing I ever learned and put to use was to trust my own gut feelings. After thinking about all this for a while, my gut feeling told me someone or something was there that night we found the penny and was probably in the apartment at various times, but I still don't know what to make of it. I do know that both Chris and I, and several of our friends, all saw things moving out of the corners of our eyes while in the apartment. Some of us have seen faint images of faces and hands on the edges of one's field of vision. There was also a mirror over the dresser in the bedroom, a mirror shaped like a door with a lintel, and it made many of my friends nervous, and me too. I always felt as though someone was staring at me through the mirror. I tried my best to cleanse, seal, or otherwise decontaminate it through various means, but the feeling never went away. A friend of ours stayed in the living room for a few months while searching for an apartment, and he told me years later that he saw things moving in the darkness. He is not an over-imaginative sort, and he's an atheist to boot and doesn't tend to look for that sort of thing, so I figure he did see something. Several attempts were made to cleanse or exorcise the apartment by myself, the high priestess of my coven, and a few other people, but the feeling still remained till we moved. Chris and I moved out of there in 1996, to an apartment in a better part of town that is at least as old as the other, but which has never had the same creepy feelings, strange presences, or sights that the old one did. My covener friends have also since moved out, but even though they lived in the same building, they never felt uncomfortable or had any unwanted phenomena happen in their place. One last thing. When we moved out, we cleaned the apartment without power, since the electricity had been switched to the other apartment. Chris says that when he walked by the open bathroom door on his way to get more paper towels, he saw, for a moment, what appeared to be bloodstains on the shower. I still don't know for sure what all that was about, but I am fairly certain that the apartment was the scene of something unpleasant, perhaps a suicide or even a murder. One thing's for sure, I'd never rent the place again. Since moving out of that place, we haven't had anything comparable happen in our new apartment, so I think the place is definitely haunted. By what? I have no idea. Plane Crash this story, although short in length, will still send an eerie feeling up your spine. It still makes me shiver just to think of that night. That night, in May it was, as if to say that any other month would not have been as spooky. It was an extremely warm night, for May in Alabama anyway. I had had a nightmare, and being only six years old, I crept into my parents' large master bedroom to recapture my thoughts and perhaps get a few winks that night. I remember climbing in the bed on my father's side and snuggling close to his arm. After a few minutes of blinking my eyes wide open, I began to feel very very cold and almost freezing. For a moment I thought nothing of it. Then I realized something was odd due to the high temperature that blew in from the open patio deck door. I grabbed my father's hand in an attempt to keep warm somehow, but it was then that I realized that it was him that was so cold. His hand was like ice. I remember being slightly horrified at that moment and I had to let go of his hand because I was getting so cold. I leaned over and tried to whisper something silently into his ear, perhaps to wake him, but he didn't stir. As young as I was, I had an eerie feeling and I quickly held my face over his mouth to see if I could feel his breath. There was nothing. Instead of being rational, as children usually are not, I stood from the bed in fury and rushed from the room screaming. When I reached the doorway, I stopped abruptly as I heard my mother's tired voice, filled with concern, asking me what on earth I was doing. To my amazement, I blinked my eyes and looked over to my father's side of the bed. He wasn't there. My mother was alone in the bed, and my father had never been there. I immediately began to cry. 
My mother told me that it was just a nightmare and that I should go back to bed and try to get some sleep. She comforted me, and it seemed that when I attempted to tell her what had happened, my words came out as nothing but a bumbling mess. The next morning, I woke very early, still not being able to let that experience leave my mind. I went to the kitchen and found my mother knelt on the floor crying. When I asked her what was wrong and why she was so upset, she held my hand and told me that my father had been killed on his flight home. He had been on a business trip to Chicago and was heading home the night before. It seems that the plane had descended to a terrible plunge after losing all engines in a snowstorm. Because of the blizzard, the plane was not recovered until late that night, with no survivors. When it was finally found, amongst miles of ice and snow, each passenger was found frozen. Cat Woman When my boyfriend and I first moved to Seattle, we rented a studio cottage apartment on Seattle's south side. Wasn't a great neighborhood, but it was cheap enough. Also, it was a nice little complex of cottages, on the ground level, with flowers and grass. Planting your own garden in your front yard was allowed as well, so it wasn't so bad. The complex had once been a retirement community, and gradually it was turned into regular apartments. There was this cat that kept coming around. It loved to come inside the apartment. It had its favorite spots to lay in, as if it had been there before. About the time the cat started showing up, we started hearing what sounded like a woman moaning. It was very faint at first, and we thought that maybe it was just the neighbors. Then our neighbors moved, the moans continued and got louder. It was kind of creepy, but the idea that the apartment might be haunted was at the same time exciting. We didn't tell anyone about the moaning because we wanted to be sure that it wasn't just the pipes or some other mundane thing. We wanted to be sure that it was something more. It wasn't long before we got our proof. Furniture started moving by itself. It was very slight, but there were a few times when I actually saw chairs move. We would draw in crayon circles around the legs of the chairs in the kitchen to see if we weren't just seeing things, and a few minutes later, we checked the chairs to find that they had moved right out of the circle. Then one day, my boyfriend was home by himself with the cat, which had gotten into a fight and had had his foot badly hurt by another cat. He was on the couch holding the cat, trying to get a look at the injured foot. The cat obviously didn't like being held at that moment and was trying to get his foot away, meowing loudly in the process. Then the moaning started. From the back of the apartment, the voice of a lady started wailing no, very loudly, and whatever was back there, had picked up a large beach towel hanging in the bathroom, thrown it into the kitchen and knocked other various items around the bathroom. Needless to say, my boyfriend let the cat go, and the voice stopped. We had a hunch that the cat had belonged to someone that had lived there before and probably died there too. We had been getting mail for someone named Alice for quite some time, so we figured it was her. A couple of months later, I was talking to a neighbor, and I asked her about who lived there before we did. She said that an old lady did, and the old lady had eight cats. One day, the old lady was gone, and the management just turned her cats loose, and the one that we were taking care of was her favorite and was the only one that stuck around after the lady was gone. Whether or not she had died, my neighbor wasn't sure. She was just sure that the lady was gone abruptly. We lived there for a few months more, and the moaning continued, but it was getting fainter. We even had a few ghostly sightings, something akin to a floating dancing white rope. By the time we moved to a bigger apartment in the same complex, all the activity had stopped. We think that maybe the ghost believed the cat was being taken care of to her satisfaction, so she left.
shaking bed. Though I do have an interest in supernatural fiction, I can't claim to be a hardcore believer in the supernatural. I am inclined to view most of the shows and reports about the supernatural with some skepticism. Being a sensible person, I tend to believe that there is a rational explanation for most things. However, I have known people and have experienced firsthand some things that defy rational explanation, so I do know not all things are in our physical domain. The story I am about to relate is one of my personal experiences into this realm. This particular incident happened in the spring of 1993, not long after I purchased a bed from a local antique dealer in Fullerton, California. I live alone so it could not have been a roommate or family member playing a joke. One day, driving home from work, I passed an antique store on Harbor Boulevard in the business section of Fullerton. I saw a bed and matching chest of drawers that just looked perfect. The design is a late 30s or early 40s style of matchstick veneer with some craved accents and brass and bakelite pulls on the drawers. It struck me as so appropriate to my personal taste that I parked the car so I could get a better look in the display window. The price tag was visible, and it looked like a fair price for two pieces of nice furniture of any era. After getting a second opinion on the deal, I purchased the bed and chest. I owned the furniture for about two months when the first event occurred. I was shaken awake one morning at about 5.15 a.m., being in California, I thought it was an earthquake, until I noticed a pressure holding down my arms and legs, but I noticed nothing else in the room was moving. Also, I could not speak. My thoughts were, what the hell is going on, then, oh god, make it stop. It scared me, but the experience only lasted about two or three minutes. I passed it off as one of those weird things that happen in life and forgot about it in a couple of days. About two months later, I was awakened by the feeling of someone sitting on the bed, again at about 5.15 a.m. I tried to see if one of my cats had gotten into the bedroom but found that I could not move. I noticed a very distinct pressure holding me down. This time it was not just my arms and legs but it felt like another body on top of me holding me down. That was enough to unnerve me, but then the bed began to shake violently. Had something not had me pinned in place, I definitely would have been shaken out of the bed. Again, I could not find my voice to say anything, but in my mind, I kept thinking, oh God, what is happening? Oh God, please make it stop. After a few minutes, it did. The noise was so loud I was sure my next-door neighbor heard the ruckus through the wall, since on a couple of occasions, she had called to ask me to turn down the volume on my television. When I saw her that evening, she never mentioned any loud thumping. This left me very frightened. I was reluctant to talk to anyone because, as many of you know, you get the look and the patronizing attitude. In September, I moved and thought the incidents would stop once I was in a new place. In November, I was awakened again at about 5.15 a.m. by the pressure holding me down, only this time it was pressing so hard I could barely breathe. I was terrified because I thought it would stop with the move. The bed began its familiar shaking. I began panicking and thinking, what is this? What can I do? God, please help me. The shaking showed no signs of stopping when I was finally able to get out. In a hushed voice, I said, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I order you to stop. The shaking stopped immediately, and the pressure on my body ceased. I was so distraught that I finally told the story to a friend, and she suggested the obvious earthquake theory. I said that no quakes had been reported on any of the occasions and that nothing else in the room was shaking. She then suggested that it might be the house coming off the foundation since it was an older house. I said that might explain one house but not both, and pointed out that at the duplex, my neighbor had not experienced this phenomenon. I also said that nothing else in the room moved, 
which would have happened just as it would in a quake. She summed it up with, there must be a rational explanation for this, we just haven't found it yet. This has not occurred since that morning I invoked Jesus' name, but I cannot explain what happened or why. It still gives me goosebumps when I think about it, and I have not been comfortable or slept well in the bed since. Speedwalker I have lived in Austin, Texas all my life. I have always heard those ghost stories, like the haunted train tracks in San Antonio or a haunted park in the hill country, but I had never actually seen anything haunting before. One day in August of 1997, my neighbor, who lives in my dorm, told me and some fellow residents about this ghost story he had heard about a lady who used to speed walk down Lamar Boulevard. She worked late hours and would walk every night sometime after 2 a.m. Apparently, on one of these walks, there was an accident. She was hit by a passing car and killed. So, the story was that if you drove down Lamar between the blocks of 24th Street to 34th Street between 1.30 and 2.30 in the morning, you could see her ghost still speed walking down Lamar. He went on to describe everything she would be wearing, white leggings, pink running shorts, a white sweater and a white cap. So, after hearing the story, later that same night, three or four of us from the dorm decided to go check it out. We all hopped into the back of a friend's truck and went to Lamar at the right time to see if we could find this ghost. We drove around for probably 35 minutes before giving up to go home. Thinking it was just some made-up story, we forgot all about it. Then, about two months later on November 1st, I went to a party with some friends. It was a Saturday, the day after Halloween, yet it was still a costume party. Afterwards, I dropped my friend off at her house in North Austin and was on my way back to my dorm. I was waiting at the traffic light on 24th Street and Lamar, about to continue east on 24th Street, which is named Windsor Street before it crosses Lamar. I was the only car waiting at the light because it was about 1.45 a.m. by this time. As I waited, I noticed a lady walking along the street on the path that borders Pease Park. She was speed walking somewhat and crossed the street right in front of me. Seemed normal enough, as there are many people who walk this trail, just not so many after 1 a.m. on a Saturday night. But what first caught my eye was how odd this lady seemed. She was walking as if she were 100 years old. As she slowly crossed in front of me, I realized that she indeed seemed very old, and I could not see her face. In fact, I could not see any skin at all. She was wearing a white cap that seemed to cast a shadow over her entire face. Then slowly, I began to realize the white cap. Her legs were white as if she were wearing white tight leggings, and the pink shorts were matching the description of that ghost story I had forgotten about. As it came back to me, she was walking right in front of my car. I was so scared that I could not move. I stared at her in disbelief, wanting to honk or something to see if she was real, but my hands were gripped to the steering wheel, and I did not move until she had walked out of sight and the light turned green. I don't know if the story about the lady was true or if I actually saw a ghost, probably never will. But the way that lady looked might have scared me even if I had not heard the story. The details matching just seemed to confirm this. I have not seen her since, nor have I heard the ghost story told by anyone else, but isn't it weird? South Brook Trailer About six or seven years ago, my family lived along Taze Valley Road before the big industrial boom of Putnam County. Seems like it went from a farming community to a city right before my eyes. Well, anyway, we rented land off of a fellow by the name of Jim Umberger. 
On this land was an extravagant pre-Civil War, almost Victorian house. It was simply beautiful. Off to the side of this massive antique sat our trailer. Now I was awful young through all of this, and kids will have their fabled ghost stories, but there was something quite odd about this house. Something was downright sour. The story had it that a family was brutally butchered in the house. Back then, there was a whole lot of nothing for miles around, so no one even found these folks for a good long time. As a youngster, I had the creeps about anything just about, but I've never been quite as frightened of a place as I was here. The place had an eerie air to it. To make things even more insane, my step-grandmother, Evelyn, died of brain cancer there in our trailer. My other grandmother's entire cancer-eaten body seized up and shut down on her, yet she died officially in a hospital. Strange things went on at this trailer. Pockets of not cool but cold air in the middle of July, for example. Once in the winter, my mother was out on the town. My younger brother and I were watching some TV when there was a knock on the door. There, on the freshly fallen snow, was nothing, no footprints, no tire tracks, nothing. Needless to say, I spent the rest of that night with my head buried under the covers. Speaking of doors, I once heard the doorbell ring. Seemed innocent enough, but we didn't have a doorbell. Pictures falling off the wall, creaky floors, and long sleepless nights were only minor nuisances we had to deal with every day. The most disturbing incidences, however, and the most annoying, were when the smoke detectors located in various parts of the trailer would take turns going off one at a time, and after that, they go off simultaneously. It was quite a ruckus. For a long time, I thought I was the only one who felt a presence. Then one night, my mother went completely irate, screaming, Show yourself, Evelyn. I'm tired of these freaking games. Show yourself. We never saw anything. Things continued as they were until we moved. Mr. Umberger sold the land to someone, and it became South Brook, a ritzy subdivision with $500,000 houses that wouldn't hear of our humble trailer depreciating their property. However, I believe they'll get theirs. Although they tore the house down for the project, there was a well and a system of underground streams and springs which probably rendered the whole operation illegal. The thing about the springs and wells may not sound important, but in my own personal research, I have found that negative forces and spirits can channel themselves through waterways. I'd like to see how South Brook likes its neighbors. Ghost Girls I live in Central Texas. My mother-in-law, whose name is Jane, has been the unfortunate victim of living with two entities for the last 15 years or so. Let me tell you about Jane. She is really great, and I would never trade her for anything. However, she is a real cleaner, and I mean, this girl can clean. She knows where everything in her house is supposed to go, and it drives her nuts if the slightest thing is out of order. You cannot wear your shoes on the carpet, lean against the walls, put anything in the fridge without wiping it off, and no smoking or drinking. They had their home built new in a new up-and-coming subdivision in 1984. It is a nice all-brick two-story home with four bedrooms and two and a half baths. The first experience came the day after they moved in. Jane and her oldest daughter, Lisa, had left to clean their former home, leaving her husband, Dan, and her two younger daughters, Lori and Megan, at home. Both girls had crawled into bed with Dan, and shortly after, Dan heard someone downstairs turning on the water and closing cabinets. He also heard them walking through the rooms and on the stairs. Dan assumed that Lisa had not left with Jane and went back to sleep. After 10, he and the younger girls got up, and when he could not find Lisa, he became really concerned. 
In fact, he was so sure that someone had been in the house that he took both Lori and Megan and drove back to their former house, where Jane and Lisa were cleaning up, which was a good 25 miles away. Later, Jane would hear high-pitched voices, and things would be moved. This especially drove her crazy because she knew where she had put something. Bad smells would come up in a room that had been vacant all day. Cigar smoke would often occur in the one bedroom that wasn't used. The doors would unlock, and this was really bad because if her husband came home, he would get really mad and yell at her, causing, you guessed it, a real strain on their marriage. She would double and triple check herself that the door was locked, and voila, it would be unlocked and sometimes wide open when she got home from the store or the bank or wherever. Light switches would go on and off, once when she was standing right next to it. The house had a real freaky feel to it, and often you would see shadows out of the corner of your eye. After I married her son and became more familiar with the problem, Jane opened up to me more. They had lived in the house for about six years when Lisa first saw the first entity. She had stayed home while Jane took the younger girls for haircuts. She was in the younger girl's room making Megan's bed when she looked up and saw a girl sitting on the floor near the TV and door. The girl was about 12 or 13, with long hair and a long dress. She had her knees bent and her arms around her knees. Lisa watched her for a few moments, and then the girl disappeared. She was watching TV downstairs and looked up to see the same girl come down the stairs and fade away. She quickly went outside and waited, nearly hysterical, for Jane to come home. The two younger girls of Jane's were often reporting hearing things, and once the older one, Lori, was pulled slightly down the stairs. When questioned about it, she told her mum that whatever touched her had been jolly. One morning while fixing breakfast, Lori was sitting at the table nearby, and Jane heard a voice as clear as day asking her a question. Unfortunately, she could not remember what the words were. Jane assumed it was her younger daughter annoying her and told her to wait. Then she and Lori realized at the same time that the voice had not been Megan or anyone else. For a long time, the entity would awaken her at night by trying to get into bed with her and Dan. She would feel it crawl up onto the bed and the weight of it across her legs. She likened it to a toddler crawling up the bed to sleep with her. When it would happen, she would lay still and wait for the feeling or presence to go away. This happened sometimes several nights in a row, and then nothing for a long time. Sometimes her husband was aware of something, and sometimes not. He remained of the opinion that all of them, his wife and daughters, were nuts, as he refused to admit to having experienced anything. Several times when Jane was reading in the bath, she would hear him murmuring in his sleep, as though the presence was messing with him. She also woke up twice, and when leaning over to look at the clock, she looked down and saw two girls lying on the floor. There was a night when she woke and saw a red door hanging in the room. I never understood where this fit in. This scared her badly, and she never went back to sleep that night. As unnerving as all of this is, Jane was never afraid. Well, at least not to the point of getting help or moving. But she was really afraid once. While vacuuming, she got really scared and, out of the corner of her eye, she saw something. Shortly afterward, she was doing dishes and got the same feeling. She turned and saw a man in the kitchen behind her, close to the table. He was short with short dark hair, parted and combed over, dark rimmed glasses, a mustache, a blue work shirt like a mechanic, and dark pants with heavy black shoes. He was gone from her vision instantly, but obviously, she got a good enough look. He frightened her very badly, but has never been seen since. Dan finally got his hands on it. Jane was up late reading the paper at the table when Dan came in the kitchen and popped her on top of her head. I just saw your little friend, he said, 
explaining that he was watching TV when he noticed one of the girls, dressed in a gown, standing at the foot of the stairs staring at him. After a moment, he realized both of his girls were much older, and they didn't wear nightgowns, nor had he seen them come downstairs. He looked again, and she was still there. After a moment, he looked again, but she was gone, and then he went to thump my mother-in-law on the head and tell her. He was pretty shaken up about it and later refused to talk about it. Jane started to really miss things around the house. A favorite hairball of Lori's was missing for months. One day, while putting away the laundry, she closed one drawer, put some underwear away, opened the first drawer again, and on top of some folded t-shirts was the hairball. Abiel's credit card went missing for several weeks, making her miss using it for a sale. Once, when putting up sheets in the closet, she could not shut it. After trying several times, she held the door open all the way, asked the presents to leave, and was able to shut the door right away. The upstairs TVs had serious problems. The one in Jane's room would glow when unplugged, and the one in the girl's room would change channels continuously when she was in the room. Once, she really wanted to watch something on Oprah while making beds. When she asked it to stop and explained how much she wanted to see the show, the TV changed channels all the way to the channel with Oprah and stopped. Lisa would wake up with one of her posters in bed with her under her covers. We came to the conclusion that it was two girls, one preteen, and one about five, with the exception of the man. The subdivision was wooded farmland before being developed, so there is no way of ever knowing what happened to bring the spirits into her home. Finally, Jane took a step that has helped somewhat. Never particularly religious, she made the decision to make it stop. She asked the presence to leave her and the family alone and put out her Bible. Since then, about two years, there have only been small occurrences that could also be dismissed as something else, but she knows in her heart that it is probably the entity making itself known. Footless Lady This story was related to me by my maternal grandmother. It occurred in Sepulpa, Oklahoma in the mid to late 1940s. During this time, my grandmother, grandfather, mother, and her sister lived in a small two-bedroom home on the southeast corner of town. My mother also had two other sisters and one brother, but they were grown and had moved out on their own. The roads around the house were dirt roads with a gravel covering, as most roads had not yet been paved back then. On one side of the house was a graveyard and on the other was an alleyway. On one average weekday morning, all four of them were up and about, getting ready for a day of work in school. My grandfather worked for an oil company, and his daily routine was to rise at 4 a.m., leave for work at about 5.30 a.m., and patrol his assigned oil leases to check on the condition of pumps, power plants, etc. Grandmother would be up with him and fix breakfast for him first, then a little later she would fix it for my mother and aunt. On this particular morning, it was a little past 5 a.m., my grandparents were in the kitchen finishing up breakfast together, while the two girls sat on the living room floor, playing and talking, waiting for my grandmother to fix their breakfast. As they sat in the living room, one of the girls looked out the living room window and saw a woman coming down the street from the direction of the graveyard. My aunt called for her parents because she was immediately scared. My mother was only four or five at this time and did not realize the strangeness of the situation as quickly as her sister did. You see, the woman was making no noise whatsoever as she approached. Keep in mind that this is the 1940s in Oklahoma, there is no air conditioning, it is summertime, windows are open, it's 5 a.m. and extremely quiet, they should have heard the crunch of gravel as the woman walked. As my grandparents approached the window to see what was going on, they both noticed that the woman's body ended at her ankles, a few inches above the street. 
her legs simply faded into nothing. All four watched in awe and fear as the woman passed in front of their house and turned down the alleyway. At this point, my grandfather decided to leave the house and approach the woman. He left through the back door and entered the alleyway. As he walked up behind the still-moving woman, she suddenly stopped and turned towards him. He stepped back in fear when he saw she had no face. Grandmother went on to say that Grandfather immediately did what his family had always been told to do in such circumstances. He said, In the name of Jesus, Son of God in heaven, who are you? The figure immediately vanished. Apparently, the belief being that the entity must either comply with the command or leave in haste. Night of the Apparitions This is, in fact, a true story, and while it may not be as exciting as some ghost stories are, it was unnerving to me and my family. January 19, 1995 I had fallen asleep on my couch and woke at about 3.56 a.m. All lights and TV were off, except for the light of the street light out in front of my house, which shows through the window. After looking at the time, I was about to get up to use the bathroom when I noticed a figure coming up the stairs behind the TV. This is a split foyer type house. The figure was wearing a gray hooded sweatshirt. I thought for a moment that it was my husband who makes frequent trips at night to stoke our coal stove in the cellar. He doesn't own a gray hooded sweatshirt though. As the figure was about to enter the bathroom at the top of the stairs, it stopped and turned its head toward me, and we locked eyes. I thought for some reason that this six-foot figure might be my four-year-old son. Maybe because of the young face, and I did realize it was male. I was frozen with fear and couldn't move. I thought to myself that if I turned away and looked back, it would be gone, but I couldn't move my head. Finally, after about one minute had passed, I was able to do just that, and the figure was gone. The same day but later, I called my mother and told her the story. She lived in North Carolina, and I was in Maine. I asked her to pass it on to the rest of the family. I don't really have to do that, since I know she would anyway. An hour later, I got a call from my brother. Who had stopped by my mother's house. He had seen the same apparition two hours or so before mine. The only other difference was that his was closer to black in color and mine was gray. All other characteristics were the same. I saw a face, he did not. His visitor passed by him on his back stairs when he was letting his dog out at about 2 a.m. My brother felt it as it brushed his face and hair. It disappeared behind my brother as he shut the door. Additionally, my sister found a broken glass in her cupboard when she returned from work the same day, January 19th. She also lives in North Carolina. Both my brother and I felt that we did not know the apparition, and we were both quite shaken by the experience. We believe it was just passing through and will not return. We're uncertain whether my sister's shattered glass in her cupboard was related to what we saw or not. Uncle Tom For several consecutive summers, my friend, who is also a co-worker, let's call him Tristan, worked in a summer camp in upstate New York. The camp catered to children with disabilities, mental and otherwise. There were also some non-disabled children there. One night, while Tristan was chatting with some of the older counselors, they began talking about a counselor he'd never met. They called him Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom had worked as a counselor during the late 70s. He was much loved by the children there, but very eccentric. 
He was known for wearing pajamas all day, bathrobes, and even a graduation gown complete with hat and tassel. At first, they thought he did it to amuse the kids, but later found out that he dressed this way year-round. He was also an amazingly talented cellist. A charcoal portrait of Uncle Tom, done by one of the children, still hung at the camp when Tristan was there. Unfortunately, Uncle Tom had emotional problems that no one knew about. One summer, just before all the children were about to leave, he attempted suicide in one of the cabins. Luckily, someone came looking for him and got him medical help before it was too late. That winter, Uncle Tom was in and out of psychiatric institutions. By summer, however, he seemed to have really gotten his act together and was allowed to return to camp. His recovery was short-lived. At the end of the summer, he attempted suicide again. This time, he succeeded, hanging himself in the same cabin he had used the year before. The children were scheduled to leave the following day, and the other counselors managed to cover up what had happened. By the time Tristan began working at camp, the head director had firmly told all the counselors that they were not to speak of the incident or of Uncle Tom in general, as it would scare the children. That year, they started out with a fresh crop of children, who knew nothing about Uncle Tom. The summer went well until just before it was time to leave. The night before, no kidding, on the exact anniversary of Uncle Tom's death, an entire cabin full of girls, ages 13 to 15, began to scream hysterically. There was a female counselor in the cabin with them at the time. Some were sobbing uncontrollably and saying they'd seen a man in the cabin, a man they didn't know. These were non-disabled children, if that makes any difference. Tristan was one of the first to get there, and was comforting the female counselor, who was also crying. He remembers her saying over and over again, it looked like Tom, he looked just like Tom. After a thorough search, no intruder was found on the grounds, nobody had been seen leaving the cabin. The next year that Tristan was there, the camp was having a dress-up day. The kids got to search through boxes of old clothing and costumes and wear anything they liked for the entire day. One boy found a black graduation gown that had belonged to Uncle Tom. I'd like to mention at this point that the boy suffered severe mental retardation and was classified as low-functioning, meaning he was barely able to talk. Tristan said he had never known the boy to speak at all, unless spoken to. Even then, not more than a few short words. Well, the boy put on the black gown and began to run around in circles, flapping his arms, calling I'm Uncle Tom, I'm Uncle Tom over and over. Tristan said that there was no way this particular child could have associated the gown with Uncle Tom, or even understood the whole story if someone told it to him. Suffice to say, the counselors were a little freaked out. The next year, some of the counselors decided to get together and have a jam session. One guy had a guitar, another had a piano. The music room still housed Uncle Tom's cello, so they thought it might be cool to add that in as well. They asked a third counselor, who'd had a little experience playing the violin, to play the cello. He reluctantly agreed, warning them that he wasn't very good. No sooner did they start playing when they realized that their cellist was incredible. They said he was playing the thing like one of the old masters. After it was over, they all asked him why he'd been holding out on them about how talented he was, but he said he couldn't remember anything about playing the cello, he'd blacked out the whole time. All the older counselors commented that they'd only heard one other person play like that, and guess who it was? Those were the only three incidents that Tristan experienced. He said he suspected there were more, but the counselors really weren't supposed to talk about it. Tristan, and a lot of the other counselors seemed to share the feeling that the reason Uncle Tom was making himself known was because he wanted his story to be told. Tristan thinks that if the head director had never forbidden the counselors to talk about Tom, 
then he wouldn't need to manifest. The camp has since closed down. Nashville Theater I personally have never seen a ghost or had any kind of experience that I would call paranormal. My brother, on the other hand, insists that ghosts are real because of what he saw. A few years ago, he was working as an assistant manager at a movie theater chain in Nashville, Tennessee. He spent one week helping out in a theater in a different part of town. He had heard the regular people who worked at that location talk about the ghost there, but he didn't believe in that sort of thing. One night, he was working late after the theater had closed. Everyone else had either gone home or left temporarily. He was working up in one of the projection booths. Suddenly, he just got an odd uneasy feeling for no apparent reason. He decided to get up and go get something to drink downstairs. As he passed the window looking down into the auditorium, he saw a figure standing at the front, dressed completely in white. He did a double take, looked down, and nothing was there. I know I saw someone standing there, there was no way the person could have left fast enough for me to not see them on the second look, he said. But he could see no one. He turned to go down the stairs. As he set his foot on the first step, a large fan, the kind that is on top of a tall pole, crashed loudly down directly behind him. Shocked, he flew down the stairs and propped the front door open. He sat there for a long time, smoking cigarettes and waiting for the others to get back. There was no way he was going back in there by himself. He said he would never scoff at anyone who believes in ghosts again, claiming that this particular ghost tried purposefully to scare him. Isabella's Music Fernando Hall, Northwestern State University, Natchitoches, Louisiana Spring 1986 Background Information Northwestern used to be a convent school about 100 years ago. It is told that a young woman by the name of Isabella came to the convent when her lover left her. She was very antisocial, always moping about. One night, there was a storm. All of the people in the convent went to the lower floor of the building, except Isabella, who insisted on locking herself in her room. The storm raged all night. The next morning, a couple of the women went to check on Isabella. After breaking the lock on the door, they found the window open and a bloody handprint on the wall. It was first assumed that Isabella simply ran away. However, since that night, strange things have happened at this location. This is the story told to every incoming freshman, at least the women, by the upperclassmen at NSU. Now, here is what happened to me. One evening, it was a Saturday, quite late, or should I say quite early Sunday morning, I was on my way back to my side of the dorm. Varnado was at that time a co-ed facility. There had been a formal dance, and some of us had continued the party on the male side of the dormitory. Between the two wings, there was a large living area with a fireplace, grand piano, large sectional sofa, big screen TV, etc., all closed off at nine at night by big glass French doors that were locked. My date was walking me across the foyer area to my side of the dormitory when we heard music, piano music. This music was coming from behind the French doors. My date and I looked at each other. Both of us mouthing the same word, Isabella. We looked through the doors toward the piano and there was nothing there, no person that we could see, yet the music continued. I am sure that this was Isabella. I had greatly discounted stories of her when I became a student at the university. However, many others had similar experiences. 
There were also times that things in our dorm rooms were moved or missing entirely for days. When we got to a point where we asked her aloud to return them, they would show up shortly thereafter. Barb's story. The following story was told to me by a woman named Barb, who came to do some interior work on our house for several weeks. As it turned out, we both experienced poltergeist activity in our lives, and she told me the most incredible ghost experience I've ever heard. Barb's grandmother owned an old and very large plantation-style house in southern Ohio. The house had three floors and sat on a large parcel of land that even once had a built-in reflection pool on the property. The house was turned into a convalescence home in the early 1960s, which was managed by Barb's grandmother and her grandmother's brother, Barb's great-uncle, who died before Barb was born. Even then, the house had a reputation for being haunted. Employees often heard footsteps going up and down the hall when no one was there, and Barb's grandmother found the bare footprints of a child on the third-floor balcony one morning after a snowfall. In one closed-off room that was locked up, the sounds of furniture could be heard moving around at all hours of the night. Some of the patients complained of ghostly visitations, which were met with grim sadness by the staff at first, considering some of the conditions of the residents. Later, some employees quit because of their own experiences. In the 1970s, the house was too difficult for Barb's grandmother to keep up so she closed up the convalescence home in preparation to sell. Barb and her family drove out to the old house to help with the endless amount of work that needed to be done in order to get the house ready to be placed on the market. It was not unusual to have workmen on the premises working in numerous areas of the old mansion, so Barb and her siblings were accustomed to running and bumping into them as they chased each other around the house. Late one afternoon, Barb was playing on the fire escape stairs, an area she was not allowed. But since her mother and grandmother were so busy in another part of the house, Barb felt she could easily get away with it. At the top of the fire escape, looking through the window of a third-floor room, she spotted a man in his late 60s with iron-gray hair and wearing dark horn-rimmed glasses sitting at a desk that was stacked high with papers. He had his shirt sleeves rolled up and was rummaging through the amazing sea of papers, as if searching for some important documents. Behind him hung a sports jacket on a coat rack. The only other thing that Barb spotted on the desk was a glass jar of stick candy. Barb assumed the man was her grandmother's lawyer or some such fellow hired by her grandmother to deal with the sale of the house. Apparently, the room was an old office of the convalescence home. The man glanced up at Barb and sat back in the chair, smiling at her. He motioned for her to come in, but Barb was worried about talking to a strange man, so she started to turn away. Then she heard the man call out, Now Barb, come back here and talk to me. The man knew her name. She turned back to him, expecting to be warned about playing on the forbidden stairs, but instead the man seemed very friendly and talkative. The man said he knew her and insisted he was her Uncle Joe, but she replied that she had no uncle by that name. She had never seen him before in her life, and she was feeling unnerved around this man, whom she felt was just teasing her for his own amusement. He then turned to general questions about school and her siblings, but Barb just hung back shyly, politely answering yes or no to his promptings. The man noticed Barb keenly eyeing the candy jar and asked her if she would like a piece. She hesitated, telling him her grandmother would have a fit if she were caught with it so close to dinner time, but the man urged her to help herself. Timidly, she took the stick of candy and backed out of the room, thanking him. She left the room, skipping down to the first floor, where her grandmother and mother spotted her eating the candy. They inquired as to where she got it, and she replied, from the man upstairs. The grandmother and mother turned to look at each other, 
then told Bard that all the workmen had left for the day and she'd better buck up and tell them how she got the candy. Barb insisted that a man was upstairs working on some papers at a desk in a room near the fire escape door and that he had teased her endlessly about being an uncle of hers. The grandmother gasped and ordered Barb to show her where she had seen the man. Barb led her upstairs to the room where she had just been. But when the door swung open, the room was entirely free of any furniture. The mother glared at Barb and chewed her out for telling such an outrageous tale, but the grandmother insisted Barb tell her more of the details. Flustered, Barb told her about the coat on the coat rack and showed her where it stood in the room and where the desk had been. Her grandmother turned to Barb's mom and said, If I didn't know better, I'd swear she was talking about my brother, Joe. Barb's grandmother asked her where exactly the candy had come from. Barb described the glass candy jar that had been sitting on his desk. Oh, the candy jar, she said. I'd completely forgotten about that. He had the most awful sweet tooth. You could never see the jar because it was always covered up with all the paperwork he had on his desk. Barb asserts that there was nothing ghostly about the man who had given her a piece of candy. He was as real as any living person she has ever seen, so she has trouble believing she talked with a ghost that day in the old building. Still, she can't figure out what happened to the coat on the coat rack and the paper-piled desk with the glass candy jar. Mimi's Jewelry Many people have tales of their loved ones passing on, and afterward, they contact them to gently let them know that they are fine. My grandmother, Mimi, proved to be as unique in death as she was in life. I guess you could say Mimi was a 1990s woman who just happened to be born in the 1880s. She was a San Francisco newspaper journalist, an avid world traveler, and married an Irishman who owned a chain of movie theaters. She became a leader in the social upper crust and had many hilarious tales about the rich and famous. After my grandfather's death, Mimi took over the business and became a force to be reckoned with in Oregon as well as Hollywood. Her passions were nightclubs, traveling, Louis XIV furniture, Sara Lee desserts, and Chivas Regal scotch. Combine all those together, you wouldn't come close to the love she had for jewelry. She didn't care if it was costume or real, as long as it was unique. At the age of 82, Mimi was being cared for by my mother with the help of hired nurses. Even during her illness, she was still a forceful presence. The week before her death, my mother's best friend, Dodie, came to visit. She and Mimi had been cohorts in several adventures and knew each other very well. Dodie had a passion for jewelry that rivaled my grandmother's. Towards the end, Mimi lapsed into a coma and they knew it was a matter of time. Mom and Dodie decided to remove Mimi's jewels as a precaution against theft. Even though they weren't sure if Mimi could hear them, Dodie explained what they were doing and assured her that the jewels would be placed in a safety deposit box. Because it was 2.30 a.m., Mom and Dodie went home for a well-deserved rest and were sitting in the living room, quietly talking, when all hell broke loose. The large picture above the couch flew off the wall and hit Dodie on the head, and seconds later, the rod in the bedroom closet, which held Dodie's clothing, fell to the ground, spewing her things all over the floor. At that point, Dodie looked up and laughingly shouted, I swear to God, Mimi, I didn't take your jewelry. But, all of a sudden, they both felt a breeze go by and then all was quiet, especially Mom and Dodie. They checked the picture, the wall, and the closet and found absolutely nothing that would have caused everything to go haywire. It was five minutes later when the phone rang and Mimi's nurse informed my mother that Mimi had passed away at 3.10, the exact time that the chaos began. Needless to say, neither of them was surprised, as they had already gotten the message. One year later, as Mom and my sister were talking in the kitchen, they felt the air surrounding them still, 
and then the unmistakable odor of Joy perfume, the only brand Mimi would wear, floated by them and disappeared. I guess the time spent on the other side had mellowed Mimi's personality, or maybe she discovered that, true to her word, Dodie had not taken her jewels. The Face of Death My aunt, Callie, grew up in a small town in Kentucky. She is not my mother's sister, but she was married to my mother's brother. Her father was dead and she and her brother lived alone with their mother. Callie's grandmother lived two streets over from them and getting to her house took about ten minutes. But it was an even quicker trip for my aunt if she simply went over the fence at the back of her yard and walked along the railroad tracks until she came to the back of her grandmother's house. However, Callie's mother did not like her doing this as she was terrified of hobos whom she thought loitered along the tracks. She was constantly warning Callie about the hobos and telling her what horrible things could happen to a little girl if she happened to encounter a hobo. Well, like all little girls, my aunt only listened with half an ear to these warnings. One day, Callie's mother had to go to take care of her younger sister who had just had a baby. It had not been an easy birth and the baby wasn't doing well. Callie's mother was the only one who could come and help. Callie was told that when she came home from school, she should do her homework, and when her brother came in from baseball practice, they should both walk around through the streets to their grandmother's house, where the grandmother would give them their dinner and they would stay until their mother came for them. Callie did as she was told, setting up her books to work on the kitchen table. She poured herself some milk, took some cookies out of the cookie jar, and settled down to do her lessons while waiting for her brother. She was very tired, and after having her milk, she put her head down on her book and fell asleep. When she woke up, it was dusk and the kitchen was almost dark. She didn't know where she was for a few seconds. Then, as she realized where she was and that she had fallen asleep, she also realized that her brother wasn't home yet. Just to be sure, she turned on lights and went through the rooms of the little house calling his name, but he wasn't there. So she called her grandmother on the phone. Sure enough, her brother was there. He had gone there straight from school because he hadn't paid attention to what their mother had told them to do. The grandmother said that dinner was almost ready and that Callie should come right over. She was very hungry and didn't feel like walking around through the streets, so she hopped over the fence at the back of the yard and started down the railroad tracks toward her grandmother's house. It was nearly dark, but she wasn't even thinking about being scared. Suddenly, in the distance, she saw a dark figure coming toward her. Her heart started to thump painfully. A hobo, she thought, in a panic of fear. She looked around quickly. There was no place to go. The sides of the track were pretty well closed in with high fences, and besides, the hobo seemed to be approaching at a very high rate of speed. Callie could see her grandmother's back fence, but she knew she'd never make it before meeting up with what she could now see was a black hooded figure. But when the figure drew up even with her grandmother's yard, it stopped and just seemed to hang in the air. She was close enough now to see it really well and the hood slipped from the head of the apparition. Callie could see nothing but a skull. She tried to scream, but her voice was stuck in her throat. And then she realized that the figure was pointing to her grandmother's house. Then suddenly, it was gone. Callie ran to her grandmother's house as fast as she could and just as she came in, her grandmother was hanging up the phone and wiping tears away with a tissue. She turned her sad eyes to Callie and told her that her aunt's baby girl had just died. My aunt Callie is now 75 years old, but to this day, she says she saw the face of death. Aunt's House 
When I was 15, we traveled from New York to Michigan to spend Thanksgiving with my aunt's family. They had just moved to a new home, a ranch house in a subdivision that had been built on farmland. There were 11 of us tripping over one another in the four-bedroom house, but we managed pretty well. Until the second night we were there. I was assigned sleeping quarters in the baby's room. In the room, there was my cot, the baby's crib, and a chest of drawers on which sat a baby scale. Just as I was falling asleep, I heard the baby scale move. Not as if it slipped across the top of the dresser, but as if something compressed it, making the springs creak. I told myself I was imagining it, misinterpreting some sound the baby had made. My little cousin made soft sucking sounds and murmurs in his sleep, and it was, after all, a strange house, I could have heard anything. But I heard it again, clearly and unmistakably. There is no sound in the world like a creaking spring, nor was the sound coming from my cot, which had no springs. I began to get nervous. I stared wide-eyed into the dark, torn between a desire to hide beneath the blankets and the fear that something would creep up on me if I didn't keep watch. Then again, I heard it. Something was in the room, something. I jumped out of the cot and hurried down the hall, joining the family at the other end of the house in the recreation room. All the adults were still up, and I sat at the table with them, scared and not wanting to go back to that room. My aunt wanted to know what was wrong. At first, I was ashamed to say anything, I just insisted I couldn't sleep. She didn't believe me, so finally, I admitted that I was hearing things in the baby's room, and that something was pressing down on the baby scale over and over. I thought she would laugh at me. I knew my mother would be disgusted. She was disgusted any time she thought I was being too imaginative or too dramatic. But my aunt and uncle exchanged looks, and finally my aunt said, well, we didn't want to say anything, but we seem to have a ghost here. It seems there was a cold spot in the hallway just outside the baby's room that smelled like mildew and moldering leaves. It would come and go, and at first they tried to blame it on the heating system creating a draft. Then, there was the night my aunt thought her daughters had gotten out of bed and were reading books in the living room. She could hear pages in a book being turned. She came around the corner to tell the girls, who were only four and two years old, to get to bed and found no one in the living room. She heard the sounds several times more. One night, she and my uncle were woken from a deep sleep by the sound of crockery crashing and shattering. They both leapt out of bed, thinking someone had broken into the house and charged into the kitchen expecting to find every dish they owned shattered on the floor. But not one thing was out of place. And then there was her four-year-old daughter asking where has the little girl gone, the little girl who played in the living room sometimes. My aunt looked at me and said, go ahead and sleep in the girl's room tonight, it's far enough away from the cold spot that I don't think you'll have any trouble. Gratefully, I crawled into the lower bunk and, listening to my two little cousins snore, I fell asleep. Sometime during the night, I awoke with a start, having heard something heavy being dragged down the hallway just outside the bedroom door. My mind was filled with the horrifying image of a body being dragged. Terrified, I couldn't go back to sleep. I listened to the cuckoo clock in the living room sound every half hour from three in the morning until six. My heart hammered so hard I could hardly breathe, and I lay stiffly, scared to death that I would hear something or see something. I knew my dad planned to get up at six so we could get an early start on our trip back. I strained my ears, listening for the sound of his stirring. Minutes crept by, the cuckoo sounded the hour of six, and finally, I heard my dad turn on the water in the kitchen. I jumped out of bed and hurried out there, wanting never again to be alone in that house. As soon as I reached the kitchen, my dad, who was standing in the recreation room onto which the kitchen opened, asked me, what were you doing out here when I got up this morning? I wasn't out here, 
I just came out here now, I said. I didn't want to admit how terrified I'd been all night, it seemed so stupid. But I saw you standing there by the sink, he insisted. Daddy, honestly, I just this minute came out here. He hesitated a moment, then said, go stand at the sink and look out the window. So I did as he asked, wondering. Then he said, I guess it wasn't you after all, I was sure it was, I could see your nightgown and long hair. Well, whoever was standing there was shorter. He never again said anything about it, except to insist that he had seen a girl standing in the dark in the kitchen in her long white nightgown. Did he see a ghost? It's possible, considering that my little cousins had seen a girl too. Or did my father simply pick up on my ardent desire to be out in that kitchen and see a projection of me standing there? For years, I was inclined to believe the latter, but I'm not so sure anymore. Cat Tales This is an absolutely true story that happened to me. It's not really important that you don't know who I am. All I can say is that I am a single mom of a now nine-year-old son. I am existing in the rut of work and raising my child to my best ability. The short story I am about to relate occurred when my son was just 23 months old, in the house we still live in. We moved into our Torrington apartment, a turn-of-the-century home on the third floor with one bedroom, in 1994. It was February, we'd been here just over one month. I was in a deep sleep, my consciousness came to me slowly as I was in such a deep sleep. It was still dark outside, but I was beginning to become aware of a sound. The sound was my cat, Priscilla. I had her for a few years, she was about five or six at the time. I truly can't say I'd ever heard the scream she was letting out in low levels that had crept into my sleep and woke me before then. I woke to find the time at 5.30 a.m. and it was still dark out. She was truly screaming in a moaning sort of way, like a human woman somehow. It truly was unearthly. I was somehow not fearful. I listened and watched with real interest. She moaned and howled for 30 minutes. My son slept peacefully by my side in my double bed, totally undisturbed. I'd heard children can sometimes see spirits and feel hampered by their sound sleep. Priscilla, with a controlled stare at a space about three feet above the foot of the bed, just howled and was so frightened that I feared for her sanity. After about a half hour, Priscilla started to back up as if something was coming toward her. She hit the headboard and really started acting scared out of her mind. I gave it a few more moments, then said, I don't mind if you are here, but you are scaring my cat, so would you please leave? In about five minutes, Priscilla calmed down. I took that opportunity to get out of bed, pick her up and hold her in the living room to comfort her. She did in fact calm down. When I returned to our bedroom, Priscilla insisted on searching the room for five minutes before she would commit herself to relaxing on our bed again. She checked under the dresser, in the closet, and under the bed. When you consider the idea that this animal was actually looking for something, it is a little unnerving. The idea is that there was actually something in the room beforehand for her to have been looking, and to relax not having found it, upon conducting a search. I have not again experienced this event since then. Fifth Street House The following story really happened, and it solidified my belief in ghosts. I was 18 in 1986, it was also the year I moved in with my boyfriend, Gary. The house we lived in was a faded green Victorian on 5th Street in downtown San Jose. 
It was surrounded by trees, which was nice in the heat of the day, but at night the trees and a very weak porch light gave it a sinister appearance. The house itself had a bit of character. There were deadbolt locks on every upstairs door but the bathroom, the floor of which slanted downward, south to north. Railroad tracks ran behind the yard, so when a train came, the entire house shook. We shared the second story with two other housemates, Veronica and Tanya, plus a few felines. Veronica and Tanya were heavy into the club scene, Gary worked nights, and I worked days, so oftentimes I found myself alone in the evenings. I don't remember when the noises started. I seem to recall it still being winter because I was getting home from work at 7 p.m. and it was dark already. So here I am, little more than a kid, by myself with only my books, a kitty and the TV for company. Usually, around 9 p.m., the activity would start. Sounds of things being picked up and put down, cupboards opening and shutting, and the occasional water running. It sounded very much like people making dinner. At first, I thought it was the neighbors downstairs. I hadn't seen anyone coming or going, but I checked with the landlady anyway. No neighbors had come and gone because there were no neighbors to come and go. The same scenario continued to occur, but now they added the muffled sounds of conversation to the mix. One morning, I shouted goodbye to Tanya as I was going downstairs, heading off to work. She asked me the following morning if I came back upstairs for anything. No, I replied. Why do you ask? She said after I went down and out the main door, she thought she heard my footsteps coming back up, but when she poked her head out of her room, there was no one on the landing. We called a house meeting. We agreed that the person or persons who were lurking about seemed relatively harmless, if a bit noisy. The decision was made to treat him or her or them as though they lived with us. It worked out quite well. One night shortly thereafter, I was trying to get to sleep and they were still banging around. I gathered my courage and stepped out into the kitchen and said, Hey, some of us have to get up tomorrow, so could you please tone it down? Imagine my relief and surprise when they did. It took me a while to get to sleep. I believe the house was inhabited by more than just the dinner people. We all had strange and scary dreams, and Gary did a lot of sleepwalking. I caught him once on the landing, about to take the stairs. As I steered him back to bed, I asked him what he was doing. I had to check the car was his response. One night, Gary woke me with the sound of his heavy breathing. When I asked him what was wrong, he said he woke up in a cold sweat, overcome with a feeling of terror. Upon opening his eyes, he said he saw a figure, like a shadow, hovering over him, and when I spoke, it shrank in size as it went back up into the ceiling. Gary was shaking all over while trying to logically analyze what happened. Even now, a decade later, when I write this, I'm getting that creepy you better look over your shoulder feeling. The disturbances continued on into the summer and fall, though the shadow guy never did come back. We moved in October of 87, it took a month for the sleepwalking and the dreams to stop. In our new apartment, all we had to contend with was a real leaf upstairs neighbor we nicknamed Claude Food Thunderheel for obvious reasons. Thus ends the saga of the house on 5th Street. San Bernardino House when I was around 8 years old in the early 70s, my parents moved my family to a rental house in San Bernardino, California, from another local town. It had probably been built in the 1950s or 1960s and was a two-story tract home on the end of a cul-de-sac with the usual yard, garage, and close proximity to its neighboring homes. At first, all seemed well. It was in good condition and not unlike the house I had lived in until then. 
We all had our own rooms, and my eldest brother, then a senior in high school, took possession of the very large room and bath on top of the garage. It would have normally been a recreation or family room, but now it was turned into a very hip teenage boy's room, complete with stereo and strobe light. This room was separated from the rest of the house by a long stairway from the kitchen area to the top of the garage. The rest of the bedrooms were on the other side of the kitchen and living room and down a long hallway. My mother noticed the first signs of trouble when our very large dog did not want to come inside the house after we had been living there for only a short while. He was raised indoors and was a very spoiled house dog who slept on our beds. He also wasn't afraid of much and was absolutely a guardian to house and child alike. Soon afterwards, a cold spot developed in the hallway near our bedrooms. At first, it was just a drop in temperature, but it became almost a physical barrier that one had to push through to get down the hall. In time, my brother's upstairs bedroom began to take on a positively creepy aura. My mother commented that she had discovered some tiny white insect that she had never seen before living in the carpet. She said they hopped away from her whenever she vacuumed the carpet. They never appeared in the rest of the house, which had typical Southern California wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. One weekend, while my brother was away, a little girl stayed over with me for a slumber party. We were allowed to sleep in the very cool teenager's upstairs bedroom, where it was such a huge privilege to be allowed in and where we could giggle all night and not keep the family awake. We were tucked into bed but found that we could not sleep. Instead of girlful mirth, we lay there in apprehension over the little attached bathroom. My mother must have sensed this, for after a while she came up and asked if we'd like to sleep downstairs. We both nodded and shot out of there like young deer on the run. My brother eventually stopped sleeping in that room. He was a high school football captain, well over six feet tall and powerfully built, and well capable of taking care of himself. In addition, he was a very intelligent young man, and I never remember him having an outburst about anything. Late one night, my father heard music coming from the upstairs stereo and went to the foot of the stairs. He said that he saw someone standing near the top of the tall narrow, and fairly dark, if I remember correctly, stairway. Assuming it was his oldest son, he gave the order for the music to be turned down and everyone to get into bed. With two teens in the house, that order was issued on a regular basis. The figure retreated up the stairs and the music was turned down or off. On his way back to his own room, my father passed his son asleep on the sofa with a blanket and pillow. He hadn't been able to sleep up there for some time and there was no one else up there. We moved shortly thereafter, after renting it for less than a year. We had occasion to drive past the house in question on several occasions thereafter to visit old neighbors or out of morbid curiosity, but that house was always for rent by owner. This is the true account as best I can remember it. Theater Ghost Being a theater major at a small liberal arts college in Iowa, I spend a lot of time alone late at night in our theater building. Certainly, every theater in the world has its share of ghosts and stories so related, but I always believed them to be exaggerations of the general feeling of creepiness that occurs late at night in a building filled with illusions. That was, of course, until I met up with our own Mr. Johnson myself. Mr. Johnson used to be the janitor of the old theater building, which was torn down to make way for a newer and nicer building about 20 years ago. He had a heart attack and fell off the catwalks in the old building. When it was torn down, his ghost was said to haunt the new building because he was angry. Yeah, right, is what I always said to this. In fact, I've been known to play three or four practical jokes on the more gullible of our students each year. But one backfired. I was in the theater at about 2 a.m., 
just after having scared the entire cast and crew with another of my hanging dummy pranks when I heard a noise in the building. I didn't think much of it and continued working. Then I had to go to the bathroom. I figured on my way I'd check out the building to make sure no one was in there trying to pull a joke on me. I went through all the rooms and theaters, came back to the office, only to find that all of the paperwork I had been working on was missing. I looked around every place I'd been. I thought I'd taken it with me for some reason, but I couldn't find it anywhere. When I went back to my office again, I saw the paperwork scattered all over the floor, with most of it ripped to pieces. As I was cleaning up, I noticed a little note that I had used in one of my many pranks. At the bottom of the note, where I had written Mr. Johnson's signature, was written, this is nothing to joke about. I still don't know for sure if there was anyone else in the building that night, no one's ever owned up to it. I haven't pulled any Mr. Johnson pranks since, 